Well, again, Happy New Year's to all of you and to all of you on live stream. Thank you for joining us today. I know we may have some over in the worship center as, as well. And um, I did win the office pool on the attendance uh, for Christmas Day, but I think I won it for this day. Looking good. Looking good. Good to have you here. So how are you doing with the New Year's resolutions? Huh? Yeah? You've made them, right? Have you broken any yet? <laughs> yeah, I know how that is. So I thought uh, you might like to hear one person's resolutions over the past few years. Uh, it might make you feel a little better. Resolution number one was in 2014, I'll try to be a better husband in March. 2015, I will not leave March. 2016, I will try for reconciliation with March. 2017, I will try to be a better husband than one. <laughs> <laughs> that is so tasteless. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, Resolution 2, 2014, I will get my weight down below 180. 2015, I will watch my calories until I get below 190. 2016, I will follow my new diet religiously until I get below 200. 2017, I will try to develop a realistic attitude about my weight. That's personal. Resolution 3, 2014, I will go to church every Sunday. 2015, I will go to church as often as possible. 2016, I will set aside time each week for prayer and Bible reading. 2017, I will try to catch the Lutheran Hour on the radio on my way to the Deer Lease. <laughs> it's all about priorities, isn't it? New Year's resolutions are easy to make, but they're tough to keep. So we have a, a, a text for today that's about resolutions. Well, it's about one resolution. One resolution that God is wanting us to make. It's found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Now, typically, on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, we cut right to the chase and we talk about the uh, circumcision of Jesus Christ. But I did that last year, so we're uh, going to talk about cutting something else today. And uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, otherwise, uh, just listen to these words from Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. We have no idea what that means. There's, there's no extra biblical source that tells us anything about this event. We just know this is what was said, what happened. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. He goes on to say, Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Again, we don't know what that's all about, but Jesus is telling us. The tower fell on them. So do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So he tells those two stories, and then he follows up with this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man, who took care of the vineyard. For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Interesting stories, aren't they? Confusing stories, I think, too. It's not the kind of readings you'd expect for an upbeat New Year's Day worship. <laughs> the first story is about some kind of massacre. Pilate ordered some Galileans to be killed, to be sacrificed, while they were making sacrifices to God. It's kind of hard for us to relate to. The second story, it's a little bit easier to relate to. A tower collapses, wiping out the lives of thousands of people, of innocent people. Just like that. And, and the point of these two stories, well, Jesus is answering a question. He's answering a question that is unspoken, at least as far as we know. But it's implied in the context. And the question is why? Why did these people die in this manner? What did they do? What kind of secret sins must they have had that we didn't know about? Because they appear to be such good people. But to suffer such tragedy. Oh my, that must have been punishment from God. That's the real question behind the question. There's a school of thought out there 
that people believe it's legitimate to ask that question today. If something tragic happens to you, what did you do? What did you do to deserve such a punishment from God? I remember in, in 2001 when the Twin Towers fell and killed thousands of people by terrorists. The great evangelist Jerry Falwell said this. He said, God is punishing the sins of our nation, our immorality. And how many great theologians have said that AIDS is punishment, God's punishment on homosexuals. And California, earthquakes is God's punishment on the Hollywood elite. And Katrina is God's punishment on the people of New Orleans because of their sinful lifestyle, especially in Mardi Gras. So the, what then does that make the winter storm that we had here, which I didn't think there would be winter storms, um, in 2008? How many of you were here in 2008? How many of you remember the hailstorm in 2008? Golf ball size hail fell from the sky. I, I'd never seen anything like it. It destroyed thousands of roofs, thousands and thousands of automobiles. Was that God's punishment on insurance companies? Does that then make that same hailstorm destroying the roof of every building on this campus, every single roof on every building of this campus was destroyed? Was that God's punishment for what? Too many people wearing jeans to church? No. <laughs> Where does it stop? Hmm? You know, I understand why it might look that way, not the jeans thing, but the AIDS thing and the Twin Towers, I get that. And maybe even Katrina and California earthquakes, I lived there. But if this kind of thing that happens is God's punishment for sin in this world, then please tell me, what was that all about? What did Jesus die for on that cross? Isn't that where the punishment for sin took place? Now, to be fair, let's make sure we know that there's a difference between punishment and discipline. All right? There's a chart we're going to put up here from Focus on the Family. And they make that delineation, that distinction between punishment and discipline. Punishment is an act of hostility on an offense. It's to, it's to punish. It's to hurt. Discipline is for the purpose of correction, of turning someone back. Ultimately, punishment comes from someone who's hostile. Discipline comes from a parent who's filled with love because they're concerned about us. Two different things. Now, I don't blame people for thinking and raising the question, why do bad things happen to people, especially when they appear to be so good? I get that. That's really a, a question Jesus was, was asked. Why do bad things happen to good people if, in fact, they're so good? Only that's not the question he answers. Instead of answering the question, why do bad things happen to good people? That was their way of judging others. He fires back with this question, are you sure you're ready to die? And what he does, he asks this question in the form of that parable, right? Right after telling him those two stories, those two tragic events, Jesus then talks about a fig tree. A fig tree in a vineyard that for three years hadn't grown any fruit and consider cutting it down. Why? Because it was useless. What was it doing? It was just taking up the nutrients in the soil. It wasn't bearing fruit. What was it good for? What Jesus is doing here is he's shifting their focus from why people die to how people should live. From why people die to how we should live. Instead of us questioning God, why are you allowing all these tragedies, all these horrible things to happen, Jesus is saying to them and to us today, what are you doing with your life for his glory right now, today? What are you doing?
Because just like that, your life could end. Just like that. It could be over. As evidenced by this unexpected massacre, the falling of the tower. As evidenced by the Twin Towers in 2001, the hurricanes and all the earthquakes and tsunamis and, and floods and tornadoes are killing tens of thousands of people all over the world probably every day, much less every year. Just like that. That motorcycle coming over the hill, coming out of Lago. Two innocent people. Innocent in that they didn't know that a young girl had go, was going up the same hill and had tried to make a U-turn but didn't quite make it. Boom! Just like that. Just like that, it was over. That same hailstorm that I just spoke about, golf ball size hail, I'd never seen it before. I want to go out and look at it. I reached for the door to walk out, and somebody says, stop. That size hail will kill you. <laughs> Just like that. You see, this whole thing here is a call from Jesus to wake up. To wake up because life is short and death is sure. And while you're still here, you've got a job to do. As a believer in Jesus, that job is to connect people to Jesus Christ. That's our calling before it's too late which could be just like that. And the number one way God connects people to Jesus Christ as their Savior is through believers. Through believers who lives, live lives of love and then share the love of Jesus Christ. That's what connects people to Jesus Christ. That's why that class by Steve Cohen I think is so important. Help us answer that question. Help us live lives that beg the question. Help us to live such a life that, that every day somebody's going to say, why do you love me? Why do you have the hope you have? Who is your God? And then we get to tell them. They've given us a platform. See? That's how it works. And this, this bearing fruit for God through our lives begins with acknowledging that you're not perfect. That's why we always have confession at the beginning of worship. We're not perfect. And we need to confess our sins to God. And then trusting that what God did on that cross works for us. It forgives us. Trust that. And trust that no matter what, every single moment of every single day, in the midst of every single thing that you experience in your life, God is with you. Trust that. God loves you. God forgives you, and God is with you. Of all the resolutions you might have made for this coming year, this one that God is teaching us here about trusting God to love you, forgive you, and be with you, it needs to move to the top of your list, of my list. Keep it at the top. I think as time goes on, as, as we, we get older, hopefully wiser, we recognize the difficulty of keeping resolutions we make, keeping some of the promises we make, which is why I believe it is critical that of all the resolutions that we've made regarding work and worry and weight and whatever, put this one right up there. No matter what happens to me, to you, throughout 2017, I'm going to trust that God loves me, that God forgives me. God is with me. Now, two things to know about that resolution. It's going to keep you focused on what Jesus wants you to focus on. Not on why people die. Not on why some people suffer tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. It's not on, on the why question. Why do some have illnesses? Why have some had emotional trauma? But it keeps us focused on the fact that God is there to guard you, protect you, love you and forgive you so that you and I can be used to connect people to Jesus the second thing about the resolution is this it's a resolution we can't keep now it may not sound like it it may not sound like it but it depends how you look at it all right you see the basis for keeping this resolution isn't about you being faithful to God it's about God being faithful to you and you trusting that it's about you and me trusting in a God who's proven himself to be trustworthy. I want you to think about that. 
He promises in here that he poured himself into the flesh of a little baby with the name of Yeshua, Jesus, to save us from our sins. Do you trust that? All right. He also tells us in his word that as a man he went to that cross to die for you, to ensure that you are forgiven. Do you trust that? He also tells us in here that he rose from the grave. He won victory over death, over sin, over the devil, for you and me, so that we can know that we will rise to. Do you trust that? That's what this is all about. If you don't trust that, you got to work on it. Well, actually, it's not you. It's actually, it's, it's, it's you and me letting God work on it for us, okay? Because it's not about us again. It's about God. It's about us just getting out of the way and saying, stopping to say no to God. Letting God teach us and move in us and through us in our lives. He's the one who's given you another year. It's a new year. It's a new day. 2017. He gives us another year to bear the fruit that he wants us to bear. That's pretty cool. Just like that fig tree. He's even giving us the means to do so. Like in the parable where the man says, Sir, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. The fertilizer God uses to strengthen you and me and our trust in him is his word and his sacraments. The sacrament you all just received and the sacrament of your holy baptism. Reminding you of the, of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that you have to remain faithful. To God. And what God wants us to learn from this story is our need to be intentional about letting God do the work in us that He needs to do, that He wants to do. Because the more we do, the more we're going to find out, though we may have difficulty keeping our promises, our commitments, we can trust God to keep His. There's two people in this congregation who practice what I'm preaching today. I mean, there's many more than that, but there's two I'm just going to mention, all right? Not their names. First person. This person I know has faced tragedy after tragedy after tragedy in their life and has asked the question, why? But this person surrounds herself with Christian friends and Christian counsel and remains faithful. She's in the Word. She's listening. The second person, horrible emotional trauma and physical illness one after another after another ask the question, why God? For years, why God? But then started writing prayers to God. Well, first started by yelling at him. <laughs> this person told me she ended up sitting in his lap, letting him love on her, sing over her. And she thanked him for loving her, forgiving her, and being there for her through everything, no matter what. I know life is difficult, and this last year has been more difficult for some than others. That's life. It has its ups and it has its downs. I know from a personal health perspective, it's been challenging for me as well. Some things outside my control. <laughs> but you know what? There are always going to be things outside of our control. Sometimes they're good, sometimes not so good. That's life. That's the way it is, which is why trusting God needs to be right up here. Trusting God to get us through whatever we face in this life because we can. We can trust Him. He's already proved Himself. And what I'm asking you and what God is asking you today is give God a chance in your life every day to prove that He's there with you, that He loves you, and He forgives you. <laughs> that much. And if you're not convinced by the manger, just look at the cross. It doesn't get any more real, any more loving than that. God loves you, forgives you, and is with you every second of every moment of 2017. And you see, this isn't really a resolution from you. It's more of one for you. From God himself. You have his word on it. Trust it. In Jesus' name. Amen.